Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay from Sony Alpha Lab and I got a treat for you today. What I got is the Sony A7C. And yeah, I'm gonna review the Sony A7C. I've had this sucker for about two months now and I've really put it through its paces and I wanted to show you what it's capable of doing in the real world. As it turns out, the C stands for compactness and that's what you get with the Sony A7C. It's a more simplistic version of the Sony a7 III pretty much, but it does have some updated features. I recommend getting it with the kit lens. Now, I, a lot of you are gonna argue that the kit lens is garbage compared to some of the pro lenses, but it's not really garbage at all. It's actually a very good kit lens in my opinion. The sharpness is excellent, but what's really nice about it is how compact it is. When you have the kit lens mounted, you could still fit it in like a jacket pocket and stuff. And the lens actually, you have to like turn it in order to get it to, its actual function, so we have to open it in order to use it. That would be 60 millimeter, and that would be 28 millimeter, and that is when it's in its closed position. And you can see from the side that it really doesn't take up that much room, you know, for a kit lens. It's, it's super compact. Now the Sony a7C goes for about $1,800, and that's a pretty good price in my opinion, considering what you get. Now it has the same 24 megapixel sensor as the Sony a7 III, but it does have a bunch of other features that I particularly like. Now, one of them, of course, is gonna be the EVF on the side here. It's quite a bit different on this side right here is the EVF. Quite a bit different than the A7 III, which has this, you know, mound on the top and the viewfinder is in the center. Now with this design, you can basically look through like this and your nose doesn't touch the screen. Now it is a smaller, electronic viewfinder and if you are a hardcore viewfinder user like if you only use the viewfinder then you're probably going to find that this quality is not as good as the a7 III because it isn't but if you mostly use the screen like I do and occasionally use the electronic viewfinder for like tracking subjects and things like that or when it's really bright out you need to use it I find that it works absolutely fine I didn't notice any problem with it whatsoever I used it and I could use it with my glasses and I was like works pretty good don't really see an issue but a lot of people don't like the viewfinder and they point it out as a negative but I just want to tell you in my experience I have no problem with it at all and it's it's pretty perfect for my purposes again I understand I'm in the minority when it comes to that but that is what it is now the screen on the back notice how it is in armor mode right now so I have the screen swiveled around that's what's another cool feature of this when compared to the Sony a7 III the screen swivels out like that and you could turn it around like so, and now it's basically in selfie mode. So you can see yourself in the screen easily. And then if you close it, now the screen is back on the back exposed, as you can see. So you can put the screen in either way. And I prefer having it in armor mode when not in use just to protect the screen, especially if I'm putting it in my pocket. It's a great feature, so I recommend putting it in that mode um, when it's you know out and about and might possibly get scratched somehow, you know what I'm saying? Now for this review, I did use the 20 millimeter f1.8 G lens. I also used the 35 millimeter, which is what I'm gonna be filming with in a second, the 35 millimeter f1.8 lens. And I also used the 85 millimeter f1.8 lens for this review. So it, when it comes to sample photos and sample video, that's the gear that I used. And of course I use the kit lens as well. So let me just cut right here and I'm gonna to switch to the Sony a7C with the FE 35 millimeter 1.8 lens and you'll be able to see how the scene changes and so forth as compared to the a6400, which does a really good job in, in my opinion, especially with the Sigma 30 millimeter. So, all right guys, so I have the Sony a7C in, in front of me now using the 35 millimeter F 1.8 lens and I'm recording in 4K quality, standard profile. I'm not using any S log or any of that stuff. I have picture profiles turned off. I'm just using the standard creative style, I should have said, and this is what you can expect to get. Now, I am using a pretty large softbox, a 36 inch softbox with a Godox light, and I have the grid in the softbox, so the lighting is pretty directional. And I, of course, I have the background lights there. I got the blue one lighting up the curtain, and then I have the hair light or kicker light here, which is a, uh, you know, 
just a LED panel, and then I have a regular light, just a lamp in the background there, just to get some kind of color variety and things like that. So this is what kind of results you can expect when recording in 4K, and it works really good. It has the IAF technology while recording in 4K, while also being hooked up to a monitor, which is what I have. I have it hooked up to a monitor right now, and if I look at the screen on the camera, which also stays on while recording, which is really nice, especially when compared to the A6400, which I was previously using. When you record with a monitor, the monitor on the camera goes out, but not on the A7C. So I could see my face on the camera monitor and also on the monitor I have above the camera. And I could see the IAF like box on my eye on the camera, so I know it's tracking my eye accurately, and that's an, a really awesome feature. In particular, let me go over a couple of the key features when the A7C is compared to the A7 III, because you might not know which one to get. The A7 III is significantly older, and you know you can you might be able to find it used cheaper things like that and it's a great camera there's no doubt about it but there are some key differences for starters we have size and weight the sony a7c is about 20 percent lighter than the a7 III. you know that's quite a bit 20 percent is is a lot the a7 III is about 650 grams the a7c is about 509 grams or so something like that now the lcd screen on the a7c of course swivels out and you can put it in selfie mode. The a7 III just has the tilting screen on the back, so you can't really put it in selfie mode. So on the back of the Sony a7 III, you do have the joystick, which the a7C does not have. The a7 III also has another dial on the front of the grip, and it has three custom buttons, as opposed to only one custom button on the Sony a7C. So if you really like those dials and you want more hands-on control, then the a7 III would be a better option for you in that regard. But if you don't really use those features so much, the a7C would be a better option in my opinion. And that's why I went with the a7C. So something that is pretty critical here is the maximum shutter speed. And on the Sony a7C, it maxes out at 1 4,000th of a second. On the Sony a7 III, it maxes out at 1 8,000th of a second. So that has a pretty significant advantage. In addition, the a7 III has a higher flash sync speed of 1 250th of a second, where the a7C is 1 1 60th of a second. And also with the shutter, the a7C is an electronic shutter only. It does not have a mechanical shutter option, which the Sony a7 III does. When it comes to Wi-Fi, the Sony a7C also offers 5G and 2.4G, so it will transfer stuff faster. When it comes to battery life, the Sony a7C also wins. It can get approximately like 680 shots or so as compared to like 600 on the a7 III. The battery is the same, it's the FZ100, so it's just a little bit more efficient on the Sony a7C, so you do get a little bit better battery life. Now the buffer on the Sony a7C is much larger than the a7 III, so you can get about 115 RAW photos in a row compared to about 89 or so on the a7 III. So that is a pretty significant advantage if you're shooting sports and things like that. Plus, the autofocus is significantly better on the a7c as i'll go over another cool thing that the sony a7c has is touch shutter it has the ability to do touch shutter so just going over a couple other things the sony a7c as i showed you earlier on the top of it it has a move or record button um, very similar to the zv1 it's in a nice spot very convenient i can easily just reach up and hit it i don't have to like feel around the back of the camera for example um, so i like that new movie button that's a cool feature when it comes to autofocus the sony a7c has just touch to track it's the latest and greatest tracking technology similar to the a9 II and a7s 3 it's really good it works excellent and the sony a7 III has the previous generation tracking which you can enable tracking but you have to do lock on tracking it's not just touch to track like on the a7c and the a7c also goes down to negative four ev sensitivity with the autofocus which is better than the a7 III which only goes to negative three ev so in other words it'll work in lower light conditions uh, and still have accurate autofocus pretty much it's just a little bit more sensitive and it's faster so for tracking super high speed moving subjects the a7c would be a better option over the a7 III as far as the autofocus system in particular so when it comes to autofocus transition speed the sony a7c has like seven steps it's got a nice variety the a7 III is limited to only three levels it's got like slow medium and fast but the a7c has a nice variety it also has option for subject shift sensitivity 
sensitivity, and that also has a bunch of steps, and you can basically determine or tell the camera how hard it is to switch from one subject to the other. So you can have it on locked on, or you can have it on very responsive, and it'll switch subjects quickly if unresponsive. On locked on, it's gonna have a hard time switching from one subject to the other, which is what you might want, especially if you're tracking like a running dog or something towards you, you're gonna want it to lock on and stay on that subject. You're not gonna want it to switch to something else when like the dog's running towards you, for example. So I recommend trying those features out because they're very powerful and it'll definitely get you better results when when tracking high-speed moving subjects like that. Another key feature that the Sony a7C has that the a7 III does not have is unlimited recording time. The a7 III is gonna cut you off at 29 minutes, 59 seconds or whatever. The a7C will just continue to record. So that's a really nice feature, especially if you're doing stuff like I'm doing right here and you're just, you know, babbling for a long time or if you're doing, you know, interviews that are gonna go an hour long or something like that. And as far as overheating goes, I had no issues whatsoever with the Sony a7C, although I do have the auto power off temperature cutoff set to high as opposed to default and high will definitely let it record longer before shutting off recording but i've never even had a warning come up and i'm pretty much shooting in 70 degree room most of the time now in the hot sun doing 4k for extended periods i would imagine that the camera is going to suffer from some overheating after recording for an extended period but um, like I said, doing what I'm doing here in regular room temperatures, no issues whatsoever. One last thing I wanted to mention about the Sony a7C is it has the new gyro stabilization analytic information. So if you go into Sony's Catalyst software, you can actually stabilize the footage using the gyroscopic information that the camera has on it. And that's just absolutely remarkable. Some of the footage I saw on YouTube of people using it, uh, it absolutely looks amazing. Now you are gonna have to turn off the stabilization on the camera when using that feature, and then you're gonna have to take your video into Catalyst, stabilize it, and then bring it into your you know, Final Cut Pro or whatever other software you're using to edit your video. So there will be another step involved when it comes to processing your video footage. It's a really nice feature for those that just want that glass stable footage, you know, just perfectly stable. It does a really good job, and uh, it's, it's just a feature that's in the Sony a7C, the a7S III also has it, and the Sony ZV-1 has it. I'd be willing to bet the new Sony A1 also has it, and then that new camera that just was released, or specs were leaked, the Sony FX3 or whatever it's gonna be called, I'm pretty sure that'll probably have it as well. So when it comes to the port doors and stuff on the side of the Sony a7C, I much prefer this design over the a7 III design where those doors would flop open and they would hang there and they would always get in the way, it seemed like. Um, the Sony a7C, as you can see here, the door opens sideways for the memory card and it only has the one slot as opposed to two, so that could be a downside depending on what you might want redundancy or whatever but you can't there's only one card in the Sony a7c one card slot it's SD slot and then below that the door flips down and that's where your USB-C plug is and also the HDMI port and in addition on the sides you have the audio for the headphones and then you also have a jack for the microphone another thing that the Sony a7c does is you can put the Sony mic into the hot shoe and you won't need any wires it can handle the audio electronically that's a huge advantage again that the Sony a7 III does not have now ergonomics wise you can definitely argue the a7 III has an advantage with the larger grip more dials more buttons more customization options but as far as technology goes the Sony a7C is superior in my opinion um, when it comes to you know autofocus technology and features that matter to me like filming in my studio here I really want the ability to have IAF while plugged into a monitor for example and I also want to see the monitor on the camera when I'm recording with a cable hooked up these things matter to people like me in addition I want the lighter weight camera because I want to use it on a gimbal for, a, so, you know, getting some sample footage and things like that. And it's heavy when you're holding, you know, a camera on a gimbal that that weight takes a toll. So the lighter the camera and the lighter the lens, you know, the easier it's going to be to hold for extended periods of time. So if you're doing traveling and you're walking around, your arm is going to be killing you. You know, your shoulders will be burning with, uh, you know, if you have a lot of weight on that gimbal. So that's, again, the Sony a7C compact. Um, is one of the key features and that's really what sold it to me was it you know the five axis stabilization is amazing and also the compact lightweight easy to use design 
And now I have the camera all configured how I like it. And I'm gonna show you exactly how I have my function menu programmed. So make sure you stay tuned for that because the function menu is gonna give you quick access to the features that matter. And because there's not that many custom buttons on this camera, you're really gonna to have to leverage and utilize the function menu to get to those you know, must have quickly get to features. And that's how I have mine all configured. So stay tuned for the end and I will show you how I have that configured. So what I wanna show you now though, is what this looks like in my hands quickly and I'll just go around the camera with it in my hands. And then I'm gonna show you, I got a ton of sample video. I got sample video using a gimbal, sample video just hand holding. I have tons and tons of sample photos as well because I've had the camera for about two months now. So I have a really nice variety of images using various lenses so you guys can see what the Sony a7C can do for you in the real world. I also did lab testing with the kit lens so I can show you a couple of shots as well just to, so you can see what the high ISO looks like and, and things like that depth of field play and so forth so all right guys let's uh, move on to the next segment all right guys so going over the camera body here looking at it from the top view we have the hot shoe here and I there was a little plastic cover on there that I took off um, just so I can hook up mics and things like that uh, right here, this little symbol, that'll tell you where the sensor is. So if you need to measure to the sensor, that's what that thing is. And then, of course, on the front here, let me switch to the front. All right, so then you also have over here, you got a mode dial, and these are the various modes. You have three memory recall modes, which is quite nice. That's what the one, two, three is. And then you have the record button here, which is super easy to press. I really like that. You have an exposure comp dial here, which has a nice feedback to it. Same thing with the mode dial. You're not gonna accidentally turn these. They have enough uh, you know, rigidity or feedback tension to avoid turning by accident, in my opinion. Up here, you have the on-off switch. It's a rocker toggle. And then you have a nice shutter button there. So you press that to uh, you know, take a photo and focus halfway. If you press it halfway, it'll focus. Now, looking at it from the back, you have the back of the camera. You got the thumb dial here, which you can turn and you can also press on the inside. There's a center button and then there's also four directional buttons you can press. So this thing turns and it presses in. Then, of course, you have the garbage can, which is your custom button if you want to program that to something. You have your playback menu button here. And this is a shortcut to drive modes. And this is a shortcut to ISO. This one here on the top will be a shortcut to display mode. And um, then you have your function menu. You have an AF on button, which by default will automatically track whatever's in front of the camera. It's really cool. You got a thumb dial here that you can control, you know, your aperture, shutter speed, things like that, depending on what mode you're in. Over here, you have your electronic viewfinder and you have a little controller here for your vision, the diopter or whatever it's called. Now here I have the screen in armor mode, which is a really nice feature. I love that feature. But if you swivel out the screen, you can see how it can turn into this mode. And you can aim it, you can aim the screen up. So if you have the camera down on the ground, you can easily see it. You can also aim it like this. So if the camera's over your head, you can see that. In addition, you can rotate it so it's in selfie mode. So now the camera is basically in selfie mode. And you could then close it back up and use it like a regular you know, camera with the screen on the back, like you can see here. So I really like to have it in uh, armor mode though, just to keep it nice and secure so nothing gets scratched by accident. Looking at it from the bottom, you have your tripod mount plate there, quarter inch thread, and you also have the battery door here. This is where the FZ100 battery goes. It's got a little blue tab there you can press to release the battery. And then you can uh, just push it in there and it locks into place with that blue tab, as you can see there. And now looking at it from the side, you got your port doors. And on the bottom here, you have your HDMI, and you have your headphone jack, and you also have your USB-C charging port and or data transfer port. And then if you open up this door, you have your memory card slot in there, and you just press like so, and the memory card goes in. And notice how the memory card goes like so. All right, so then continuing on to the top here is where we have the microphone input right there. So if you're using a microphone with a cord, like the Rode Video Micro, for example, you plug it into the mic port right there. But also the hot shoe can transfer electronic 
audio as well. If you use one of the high quality Sony mics, you can electronically transfer the sound and it'll go right into the memory card and you won't have to use any cables like on other microphones. Although it does cost a lot of money, but uh, it's great to know that that is a feature and you won't have to deal with cumbersome wires. So looking at the front here, you have the right here you have so looking at the front you have the AF illuminator there which will help you focus in really dark situations it'll illuminate but also it'll blink as a self timer and uh, it'll give you a heads up when the photo is about to be taken in self timer mode and things like that now if you unscrew this cap you will see underneath the full frame sensor and you can see just how big it is it's incredible and by default with the kit lens, I got the kit lens because I wanted a super compact setup for certain situations. So I went ahead and got the kit lens with this camera and you just hit this button here to release the lens. And all you gotta do is line up the white dot with the white dot on the flange, like so, and then turn it. And I go into more detail on how to do all this stuff in the how-to videos that I have and uh, those are linked below and they'll also be linked at the end. I'm just going over it pretty quickly here. But notice how this lens works. This is in the closed position. So if you turn the camera on, it'll say um, open the lens before you can use. So what you gotta do is you gotta turn the lens like that and now the lens is in a usable open position. So this would be 28 millimeter and this would be 60 millimeter. And it is a variable aperture. So it's f4 to f5.6 which you may or may not like. That is definitely slower than a fast lens, but it's ultra lightweight and it's also ultra compact and it has the ability to retract like that. And I believe it's worth getting as well as the kit. Even if you don't use the lens that often, it's great for certain situations when you want the lightest possible camera. You'll be more likely to use the camera if it's light and easy to use, in my opinion. All right, so I'm gonna boot this camera up, but first I wanna mount it to a little mini tripod here and check out this little mini tripod I got. This thing is sick. It's really, really high quality. I'll put a link for it down below, but it's metal legs and these legs actually come out so you can make the legs even longer. And it's just super high quality precision. This knob here, like it just has this unbelievable dampening on it. And I need to take that off anyways. Here's a little camera plate that goes on the bottom. And same thing with this knob. It's just the dampening feels so good. And these legs have these nice lock levers. You just pull that down and the legs go all the way up. So you can put them in a number of positions. They pre-lock. Really, really nice design. So I'm just going to open it up like this. And I'll put that flat down like that on the desk. And I'm going to mount the plate to the bottom of the Sony A7C. like that. Got the clip mounted, that's pretty good. And a little straighter. Alrighty, throw that on the tripod here. Little mini tabletop tripod, super high quality. Like I said, I'll link that below. So I'm just gonna take the uh, screen out and articulate a little bit. Alright, so let me turn this guy on just by hitting the toggle here. Alright, so it's telling me that the lens is not open, so I have to turn the lens, like I showed you before, to open it. Take the lens cap off. And that's what you can expect. We got a no card flashing warning there. So let me put a card in because that's pretty annoying. All right, so in order to navigate the menu, what you do is you just hit the menu button to get into the menu. And then you use this directional pad here, which spins and you can push it as well. All right, so what I wanted to show you really quickly is just how the menu system, like what it looks like. I'm not gonna go through it though because I have a dedicated video on all this stuff, but the basic understanding what I want to show you is how the menu is set up. It has tabs and then within the tabs it has pages. So you can see there it's one of three on the network tab. And you can scroll if you go all the way up to the top. You can scroll through the tabs like so. And then this is the my menu area. If you want to take a picture you basically just press the shutter button down and it'll automatically focus and take the photo. You can hit this button to record obviously. Just hit record at any time but um, you really wanna be in movie mode. I recommend using movie mode if you're recording video. But again, check out my other video on how to use the camera and that will cover that in much more detail. All right guys, let's go over some sample photos and some killer sample video, which I have a ton of.
for a quick walk with the kids. Let's see what happens. Didn't want no one to hold you. What does that mean? And you said, ain't nothing gonna break my stride. Nobody's gonna slow me down. Oh no, I've got to keep on moving. All right, so I got a treat for you guys here. This is the Adventure Crawler. It's a 124 scale RC rock crawler truck. And just look at the suspension. This thing goes for about a hundred bucks and just the suspension travel and articulation is absolutely unbelievable. It's so realistic. It's got a four link suspension. And as you can see here, when I slow it down, you can just see the incredible art articulation. So I was filming with the A7C using the 85 millimeter F1.8 lens at 1080, 120 frames per second. And that's what allowed me to slow it down here. So you can really see that incredible suspension. It's just incredible. I, I mean, and out, not only that, it's so much fun to use. You could make little obstacle courses around your house and you will not believe what this thing is capable of climbing over. The tires are like realistic. It looks like there's low pressure in the tires. It feels like there's low pressure. Like I'm telling you, the amount of engineering that went into this is absolutely remarkable. It can climb over a 45 degree angle there's tons of them on uh, Amazon and, and on the internet and stuff. It's basically just a 124 scale rock crawler type RC car. Just look for that and I'll have it linked below. Ain't nothing Ain't gonna break my stride. I'm, I'm running and I won't touch ground. Oh no, <laughs> we got to keep, keep on moving. moving. All right guys, so I just wanted to go over the ISO testing really quick and I'm going to keep this short and sweet. I'm just going to show you the max ISO which is a hundred and two thousand four hundred on the right hand side here you can see and then on the left hand side this is the lowest ISO which is ISO 50. So you can see here looking at the dollar bill what kind of you know noise degradation and detail retention is happening when it comes to the high ISO and, and honestly in my opinion for 102,000, this is actually really good. You can't quite read the text on the crayons like you can on the ISO 50 image, but you can read most of the stuff on the dollar bill and you still get, you know, a lot of detail. When you look at it from this view, for example, you know, it looks pretty good. I mean, you could definitely see the colors have shifted a little bit in the chart, the Macbeth chart here up on the top. If I zoom in on that, you can see there's a lot of noise and the color did change a little bit. But what I noticed more than anything when in the color shift is on this little bracelet here. You see these red little beads? They turned like, I don't even know what, like the color just disappeared. So I was kind of surprised by that, to be honest with you. And a lot of the shininess from the chrome and detail you lose. But again, when you zoom out at it and look at it from this view, it's actually not that bad. So just as a comparison, let me show you ISO 3200 and ISO 6400 so you can see the difference. Okay, so here is ISO 6400 on the right-hand side. And you can see just how crisp and clean and clear it still looks at ISO 6400. The 24 megapixel sensor is really good quality and it handles this high fairly high ISO extremely well you can see a little bit of noise starting to creep in here on the grays on the right on the carpet and stuff like that but when you look at the uh, you know chart and like the dollar bill and stuff it's really not that noticeable you can see a little bit of noise here on the chart but again it, it looks it looks really good at ISO 6400 so this is definitely a usable ISO in my opinion when i use auto ISO i basically have the camera set to the lowest 50 or 100 when you're using the auto ISO the lowest you can put it is 100 so i have the low end set to 100 and the high end i have set to 12800 so 12800 as you can see here also still looks pretty darn good so this is what I have for like my max ISO when I'm using auto ISO. And you can see the color retention on the bracelet is still very good. 
and the details on the chart are also looking still fairly accurate. All right, guys, so now we're gonna go over the real world photos. And like I said, I have a ton of photos because I've had the camera for a few months now and I used multiple lenses as I described earlier. So what we're looking at here is when I first got the camera, I actually left it in JPEG mode and you can see up here on the top left is the EXIF information. So you have the file type, whether it's raw JPEG or TIFF, TIFF meaning that I edited it in Photoshop, for example. Then you have the shutter speed, the ISO value, and of course below that, what lens was being used. So I was using the 28 to 60 millimeter kit lens here for a couple of these shots in the beginning. And like I said in my video about that lens, it's a, actually a really good kit lens and the image quality that comes off of it is, is quite good in my opinion. And then over here on the right hand side is the development panel. So you'll see if I did anything to the photos over here. Most of them are straight off the camera. A few of them I did edit though and uh, you'll see that over here on the right. And also I'll let you know if I did uh, like hardcore editing one way or another. So here's one of my dad with uh, Jasmine <laughs> likes to lay on his shoulder. This was actually at Thanksgiving and uh, my brother actually made some killer candy bacon with this thick cut farm fresh bacon that he got. And here's some other hors d'oeuvres, some chips and dip. And just look at that separation you can get. And again, this is that full frame sensor, um, even with the slower lens, like the kit lens here. So I was at 60 millimeter f 5.6 for this image and you can sit and you could see the background separation is still quite good the iso is at a thousand but you don't really see any noise or anything image quality is really good on this camera and here's one of layla holding a piece of that cooked candy bacon now that it's cooked and again look at that separation it's pretty darn good and this is at iso 2000 and you can see over here on the right i did pull the highlights back a little bit and uh, drag the shadows up a touch some mustard and just another beer in a glass. And again, just that, looking at that separation, color, clarity, really good. Now here's another one of uh, Jace's toy. It's called Goo Jitsu. <laughs> Goo Jitsu, you squeeze these things, they're like, they're, they're, they feel really cool. They got stuff in them, like slime and stuff. But anyway, I pulled back the highlights on this one and you can see this is what it looked like originally. And this is what it looked like after I did that. I'm just hitting the backslash key to show you a before and after. I'm using Adobe Lightroom here. Here's some more food shots. And I'm just going to scroll through quickly. Here's some uh, delicious stuffing, some twice baked potatoes my dad made, some cornbread. Here's one of Jace. Now this one I did edit. This is an edited image. I took it into Photoshop to edit it. And here is what the original file looked like. So this is the original file and here's the edited file. So the original file, I did do a little bit of adjusting here in Lightroom before I launched it into Photoshop and actually did the editing. But what I wanted to show you was just how amazing this looks. Check that out. And that's incredible. And that's with the kit lens, guys. So it's, you know, it is what it is. Here's one of my neighbor's dog. And I was using the kit lens. This is Caesar. I was using the kit lens for this shot as well. Now I switched the lens to actually the Viltrox 85mm f1.8 lens um, just to get more separation in 3D pop. And you can see here, this looks much more, you know, like professional because the background's really blurry. It's got some nice 3D pop, color clarity and so forth. And you can see on the right hand side, I did do a little bit of adjusting. It was at ISO 4000, pretty high on the ISO level. Here's another one. And here's another one. Just playing around at work here. This is another one shot with the kit lens of just some cable. And there's another one looking down, looking down a little aisle. Just zoomed in here on the minimum focus distance. I'm now using the 35 millimeter f1.8 lens. So you can see the depth of field is much narrower because I am working with f1.8 now instead of the slower f4 to 5.6 aperture on the kit lens. So that is the advantage of using a faster prime lens like this one. And all this stuff will be linked below if uh, you want to check it out. Here's one of the cool Dodge Charger that I built. I actually have a video about this if you're curious, if you want to watch the build. Really cool Lego project. It's a fairly large car and uh, the engine actually works and stuff. It was a lot of fun building. Uh, here's just one from the front. Look at this thing. Charger. All right, so back over my parents' house. And I just took a picture of the toaster. They got a new toaster. Some spaghetti and meatballs. Gotta love it. Yummy, delicious, always good. My mom makes amazing meatballs and sauce. And uh, I got some killer bread from the bakery. Mmm, mmm. 
There's one of Jay's. He wouldn't eat the spaghetti and meatballs though. So uh, he had his chicken nuggets. <laughs> and now we're up to Christmas time. So here we are over at uh, mom's house at Christmas time. And here's a couple of snapshots of the kids. They were having a great time. They got some cool stuff. And Jay's got some more of the uh, gujitsus. And just again, look at this background separation here. You see the Christmas tree. It just butters out to these killer bouquet balls. And just the narrow depth of field. Minimum focus distance, all that stuff. I love the 35mm f1.8 lens. Quickly becoming one of my favorite lenses, to be honest with you. I love using it. Here's another one of Layla. I played around with this one a little bit. I actually blurred the edges to draw the eye in a little bit more. So I brought this one into Photoshop. Did a little bit of editing. Here's another one of Layla and her new jammies. Just a cool beer can. I like the way that this one looked. Had a cool design on it. And again, the color clarity quality of the Sony a7C that it produces in combination with a killer lens. This lens I was using the 85 millimeter f1.8 lens so I was getting more background separation which is why this looks even more 3D than if I shot it with the kit lens for example. And here's just another one. Looks really good in my opinion. Here's one of Jace. Got a cool hat. Here's my mom. She was super happy. Got to see the kids. We didn't get, she didn't get to see the kids for a while because of the COVID and everything. You know the deal. Here's one of Layla. These are pretty much straight off the camera raw files, as you can see. So, you know, the white balance is going, you know, here and there because I have it on auto white balance. Here's one of Jasmine peeking up while we're sitting at the table. Here's just a picture of a bunch of pictures on my mom's table here. Thought it looked pretty cool. Nice variety of uh, stuff to look at, you know. And here's just one. I focused on the candle and I wanted to show just that unbelievable separation you can get, depth of field play. Again, I'm using the 35 millimeter on this particular shot. And I did crop the image and I played with the highlights and the shadows a little bit over here. But you can see just that unbelievable image quality on this camera is great, especially when paired with a good lens like the 35 millimeter. Here's some mashed potatoes and here's some green beans looking really delicious and fresh. And my brother made this absolutely incredible braised short rib. The best I've ever had in my life. It was absolutely unbelievable. It was so savory and rich. Um, the, you know, the process, I don't know. It took hours and hours to make using Dutch oven and searing and all sorts of other stuff. Now, I actually made these killer mini Philly cheesesteak type sandwiches. And I actually took a whole bunch of video footage showing you how I made these. So let me just cut to that quick and let's watch the video footage so you can see how I made these delicious Philly cheesesteaks. So, you know, if you want to make them yourself, you can make them yourself. They came out unbelievable. I always like to use the cast iron pan. It's my favorite. Set that burner up there. Cutting up some peppers. And just got to dice them up into strips, as you can see here. There's the peppers. And I got some mushrooms here. A little bit of avocado oil. Get that burner heat at the right temp. And uh, gotta just saute the vegetables. A little slow-mo action. I recorded at 120p for this segment here so I could slow that down. And I was basically just point and shooting recording video here. Not really too much to it. I was just using the touch to focus to set the focus point where I wanted it. Now I got these Hawaiian rolls. Delicious. They're sweet rolls. They're a little bit sweet. Got a big Pyrex dish here. And here is the strip steak. Just kind of slice it up into, you know, just basically want to shave it as best I can, but I'm using a knife so I can only shave it so well really wanted it like paper thin but you know this is really the best I can do but what I had to work with and the vegetables are looking pretty good got them all sauteed I'm gonna take them out and put them in a bowl for now and then I'm gonna throw the steak in just want to rinse this out quick again I was using slow-mo for this so 120p and I just slowed it down. Got a little mayo here, a little bit of Worcestershire sauce in the mayo. Add that little bit of flavor. I'm gonna spread that on the bun. 
I just sped that up, a little speed ramp here in Final Cut, and I'm just going to spread this onto the bottom of the bun here, and then I'm going to continue cooking. Throw that steak into the pan. I just want to brown it a little bit, just add a little salt there. I don't want to cook it too much, I just want to brown it because it's still got to go in the oven. So I'm just going to stir it around, add a little garlic powder here, a little extra flavor, you know the deal. Layers of flavor is what I'm going for. And I'm just adding the vegetables, now that the steak is pretty much where I want it, I'm going to add the vegetables. And again, I don't want to cook the steak too much because it's still going to cook in the oven. So I want it like, you know, 80% done. Now I'm gonna throw some killer provolone on top. Layla wanted some without the, uh, peppers and onions. And I'm just gonna set the oven to 375. And then I'm just gonna make some garlic butter to spread on top of the bun. And that'll make it nice and extra good, delicious, and you know, crispy and shiny. So I just melted the butter in the microwave for about, you know, 30 seconds, a minute or so. And I'm just gonna spread it on top of the buns. Look at that, unbelievable. Now I'm gonna throw some foil over it and put it in the oven. So I'm gonna set the self timer for about 25 minutes and this is the result. And I'm just taking the foil off and I actually put it in the oven for a couple of minutes without the foil just to make sure that they were extra crispy on the top and this is what they look like. I mean, come on, incredible. All right, so moving on here, headed over to my favorite local restaurant, fairly local restaurant, called Eddie's Roadhouse in Warwick, New York. And here's just a picture of the street walking to the restaurant, and I just thought this image came out fantastic. It just has that magical full frame, you know, 3D pop, lighting background. I mean, it just has all the elements that I like to see in uh, cool street photography and um, it just came out cool. I, I thought it looked good so I wanted to uh, show you that shot and explain it a little bit. Here's one inside Eddie's restaurant. We're sitting at the bar, me and my brother. And we got trivia night. All sorts of cool stuff to look at in this restaurant. And here's just a picture of killer sandwich on, the, uh, on some foil. It's got that cool depth of field background blur which is why I took this shot. The lighting wasn't the greatest for the for the actual image of the food, but and here's just a gentleman playing on his phone. This is taken with the 35 millimeter f 1.8 lens, and again, just look at the detail. Depth of field is very narrow, so you could see the you know sharpness is limited to just the face area. And one cool thing about Eddie's, one of the reasons why I like it so much, um, there's no TVs. And they everybody brings like sample beer and stuff. So when you sit down at the bar, they will they'll break out like a beer from the uh, beer cooler, and they'll just pour these little samples for everybody sitting at the bar. So if you're sitting there, you order a drink and stuff, you're having a good time, and then all of a sudden a sample will come around, and you get to try something different that somebody might have brought from out of town, out of state, whatever. It's a really really cool experience, and you just end up talking to people because there's no TVs and stuff. So you end up having good conversations. Everyone's always cool there. It is definitely the best restaurant around in this area, and it's in Warwick, New York. I highly recommend checking it out. Really, really good stuff. All the staff is great and everything, and that's what it looks like from the street on the front there on the sidewalk. And I actually went back another day. This one, like I said, this is over the course of a couple of months, all these photos, guys. So this time I went with a 20 millimeter f1.8 G lens. 
So we're gonna get a wider view compared to the 35 millimeter lens. And here's one of the bar, here's one of the menu. Now I just wanted to show you over here this on the menu, this three-way pig play. That's what I got for my uh, meal. So you'll see that in a second. And it's cider, brined pork chop, shaved pork tenderloin, pork belly fried rice. I mean, are you kidding me? Pork belly fried rice, how could you not get that? And they have these cool taps. I love these taps where they make them out of the old metal wrenches and stuff. They look so cool. Got some fried calamari as an appetizer with these three dipping sauces. So look at that calamari, look at that crisp. And notice, even with the 20 millimeter, the depth of field is extremely shallow, even though it's a really wide angle lens. But it's great for stuff like this. If you want a wider angle view and you're taking food photography because you want to incorporate a little bit more of the restaurant, for example, 20 millimeter is a great option. Normally I would use the 35 millimeter for shots like this. But again, if you want a wider view, um, you can go with the 20 millimeter. And you could notice you do get a little bit of distortion with the 20 millimeter. You can actually see it on this pint glass in particular. And that's just because it's such a wide view. And same thing with this can here. This beer was absolutely unbelievable, by the way. It tasted like a passion fruit. I don't know. It was unbelievable. I've never had anything like it. Um, but you could see the can is fairly distorted because I was so close to the can using such a wide angle lens. Now here is that pig play that I got for my meal that I showed you on the menu before. And just look at this. I mean, come on. Absolutely amazing. Bone in pork. Look at that. Oh man, this is what my brother got. He got the shrimp sandwich and it was also delicious. Here's a picture of the pork chop. Look at that pork chop. Here's a bite I got on my fork. And you can see just like how it's, you know, braised on one side or seared, whatever you want to call it, that juicy rice. It was nice and spicy and savory. I'm telling you, it was one of the best things I've eaten in a while. Every time I go to Eddie's, I try to get something different. There was actually pineapple in there. It's a chunk of pineapple. I mean, it was ridiculous how good it was. Now we're getting up more towards recent times. This was just the other day outside playing with the kids and I strapped on the 85 millimeter. We got a lot of snow the other day and uh, I blew all the snow with the snowblower into this big mound and uh, the kids and some neighbors were playing, having a great time. You could see him here having some fun. Here's one of Layla, and here's one of the neighbor. Here's a couple more of Jace. And I just froze the action. They were throwing some snow up, and those are always fun shots in the winter. So as long as it's bright out, you'll get a really fast shutter speed. So you can see here, one four hundredth of a second, and that pretty much froze all the snow in the air. Um, you could even go with a faster shutter speed if you want more, you know, less motion blur, because there is a little bit of blur to the snow. Here's one of Layla. You can see all the snow still in her hair from throwing the snow around. She's giving me the thumbs up. Oh yeah, flexing. And here's one of Jace on top of the pile. It's handsome. And the 85 millimeter lens is also just ridiculously high quality and uh, one of my favorite lenses for stuff like this. And here's one last shot of one of the neighbor kids. All right guys, let's get back in there. Wrap this review up. All right, so now for the bonus part, I just wanted to show you what my function menu looks like. If you hit the function button here, the FN button, go in here and you can see how the function button is configured. This is how I have my configured. It seems to work really well. I have the metering mode there. I have ISO auto minimum shutter speed, an absolutely amazing feature. I cover in much more detail in the other video. I have interval shooting there, focus area, focus mode, white balance. I have it custom set right now. Face eye priority in AF I have over here. I can turn the camera into silent shooting mode right there. So all the key features, creative style, steady shot I can turn on and off there, and then file format. That's how I have the function menu configured when in the photography modes. Now if I switch it to video mode, let me show you how I have it configured. So now I'm in video mode. Notice how the audio meters came up. If I hit the function button, now I have a pretty much a completely different function menu. Although some of the settings are the same, I have the facial recognition on the top there, and this is just the audio record level, and if you're using a microphone, you definitely need to check that to make sure that you're not blowing it out. Focus mode, this is where you would change to manual focus if you want. Focus area controls where the camera focuses. And then you have AF transition speed, awesome feature. You can go in there and you can actually change how quickly with seven steps how quickly the focus will transition once the focus is acquired. And again, I will show you that in more detail in the other video, but I just wanted to show you how I have the function menu configured for a little bonus here. Now, subject shift sensitivity is right there. I have that set in there to two. Now you have 
picture profile, which I plan on starting to use pretty soon. I just haven't really gotten around to that yet. And then you have white balance here, creative style, steady shot. You can turn that on and off. I wanted to try out that gyroscope stabilization, so I have that set in there so I can turn it off. Then we have APS-C, super 35 millimeter mode, and then this is your exposure mode. So that is how I have my function menu configured. I really hope that that helps you out and, you know, just at least to get a baseline as to how you might want to set yours up for uh, purposes. Now in here is the function menu set, and this is where you would control your function menu for photos and video. Notice on the top, it shows a picture right here, which stands for photos. And then down here, this one stands for movies. So when you're in movie mode, your function menu will appear completely different if you have it configured completely different like I do. Um, and that's where you would go in and set that. All right, guys, so at the end of the day, the Sony a7C, like I said, goes for about $1,800. And for that amount of money, you are getting a fantastic product, in my opinion. I mean, the image quality is killer. The video quality is also amazing. The stabilization system works great. The compactness of the camera is excellent. And, you know, in my opinion, it's worth the money for sure. And I particularly like that compact design. I actually like the EVF on the side as opposed to in the center. And I don't mind the lack of buttons and things like that because I just use the function menu to get to those other features that I might need. So it's not that big of a deal, but it is important to note that you, that might matter to you. And the Sony a7C doesn't have as many physical buttons and or you know customizable abilities due to the lack of buttons and things like that. For me, it doesn't really matter that much. I have the camera set how I like, and I just use the memory modes to change it to the settings that I used most and it just works out really well, especially like I showed you in the function menu, all the key features that I need for video are in there, and it's not a big deal to just go into the function menu and change them as needed as far as how I like to work. So it is what it is. All right, so that is pretty much it. Please let me know what you think of the Sony a7C, and please be sure to hit that subscribe button, notification bell, and a big thumbs up if you found this video slash review helpful. I would really appreciate it. The thumbs up helps. Also, if you could leave a comment below, that'll also help. Let, let me know what you think of the video, and let me know what your thoughts are on the Sony a7C, how you like to use it, what you use use it for and so forth. I would appreciate that. And also feedback. If you have any feedback for me, I'd love to hear that as well. I want to make these videos as good as possible. So your feedback is greatly appreciated. Be sure to check out the tutorials. I got tutorials up here for you to check out. that will get you going with the Sony a7C if you're a beginner or even a more advanced user. Uh, I have quite a few tutorials that'll help get you going. So I will catch up with you guys next time. Please have a great day and be safe out there. All right.